An often cited rule of horror is to hide the monster, that is, treat its reveals carefully and don't give away its appearance completely or right off the bat, since the viewer's imagination can concoct something far more terrifying than anything that's visually depicted. After playing Fear and Hunger, I'm not entirely sure that's true. Fear and hunger is the sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach right before the antagonist of your nightmares snaps its teeth down on either side of you. It's the tragedy of a tight space caving in from all sides in pitch darkness. It's the broken promise of telling a loved one that everything is going to be okay and then failing them. It feels less a game and more an unholy piece of lost media that is begging not to be played. Characters lose everything, soft locking save files, arms and legs can be permanently lost, surviving's almost impossible, and even if you do succeed, your character is guaranteed to not come out the other end the same man or woman they were before. To have even a chance, you'll need to scrounge every container, talk to every NPC, and avoid most encounters with enemies outright. The dungeons will introduce tantalizing questions and perplexing mysteries that are sure to disrupt your peace of mind. Like a knot of barbed wire, fear and hunger is something that you can't help but try and untangle, even if it hurts you. Consider what entering a battle feels like in most RPGs. The music kicks into high gear with boundless optimism punctuating the sounds and visuals as you trade blows with whatever colorful monster you're fighting. Now contrast that to Fear and Hunger, where entering a battle feels less like something that's part of the game and more a terrible, terrible mistake. Many video games spoil us, piling dozens of legendary blades and glowing power-ups at our feet. Fearful will stop playing as interest leaves us. Yet this game gives you mere table scraps, and you'll be thankful for them. How your story begins depends on which character you choose. All are wrestling with their own demons, but they have one thing in common. Their journeys converge in the dreaded dungeons of fear and hunger. You start just outside the gate of the first floor. A thick fog breathes down your character's back, reminding you that there is only one way forward. There are several containers you can loot before you enter, but lingering outside for too long isn't a good idea. Predictably, the first floor is where you'll come to gripes with how this game ticks for a lot of your playtime. Giant guard enemies are peppered throughout most floors, and you'll find yourself hiding out in smaller rooms, flipping them upside down to find every single helpful item you can. These range from consumables that give you a tiny amount of health to a book that permanently teaches you how to do a spell. Leveling up, like most things in this game, is complicated. You don't generate flat experience with each fight and get stronger. Rather, your class and affinity with whichever god you're praying to unlocks the ability to select certain skills. On top of that, you'll need an item called a soul vessel to spend a point to gain whatever skill it is in the first place, and you'll need to fill that item with a defeated enemy or NPC's soul. Even then, you can't access this skill tree just anywhere. You'll need an item to unlock the room where you can even use it. It's as cumbersome as it sounds. But provide that everything falls into place and you play your cards right, it's a very elating feeling to have the stars align and gain an advantage from your skill tree. Visually, Fear and Hunger resembles a renaissance painting that is seen too much. Characters are shaped from soft brushstrokes that exude features far too gentle for this setting. This is particularly noticeable in battles like most turn-based games. The overworld sprites might have some of that RPG maker jank to them in their movement, but if anything that just makes the behavior of these creatures seem all the more unnatural. That's not my biggest concern with the game though. When I saw how much people loved replaying this game, my biggest question was, how is a horror game so replayable? If you made a list of things that that genre was known for, I don't think multiple playthroughs would be on it. Yeah, there's multiple characters, but how fun can each of them be when you're trekking through the same dungeons countless times? For as hard as the game is, won't it become a brainless and formulaic trek each run once you've found a comfortable tactic to lean into? Well, ignoring the fact that even the easiest difficulty mode takes a good chunk of time to become versed in, 
It takes more than mere memorization to survive the gaping cruelty of fear and hunger. The game wisely borrows some design choices from roguelites. You can look some stuff up, obviously, but I recommend keeping this to a bare minimum as much as possible. Knowledge is infinitely important, sure, but even if you knew fear and hunger like the back of your hand overnight, you'd still need to adapt to the circumstances the game shifts around you, as dungeon layouts and crates are not set in stone. Important landmark locations like the Human Hydra are randomized. That's not to say the dungeons don't feel like handcrafted experiences, because they still do, but there's enough variety in how it spawns the cliff notes of these dungeons that it shakes off a lot of the mundanity of playing a game multiple times. There's also variation in how items spawn. Containers do not always have the same consumables, which I was really glad to learn since the opposite would have meant you'd take the same routes over and over just to get the best stuff, though this does call into question one of my bigger issues with the game, which might sound petty at first, but I think you'll agree with me once you've spent enough time with it. It can be very annoying having to loot so many different containers. Seriously, I feel like a good amount of playtime is spent opening these things, but the excitement of finding a health potion, or even something small like a herb, really does alleviate this repetition a lot. Replayability, while surprisingly competent, is not the most impressive element of Fear and Hunger, because putting aside the cruelty of its mechanics and how ungodly its creatures can be, neither are as terrifying as the game's scariest component, the sound design. I made the mistake of playing this game with headphones, and the hair on my neck was perpetually on end. Everything from the floor creaking to the way weapons sound is engineered to make you as uncomfortable as possible. I don't think I could have imagined a more scary collection of sounds in my dreams. Save for my dad snoring, this is easily the scariest collection of sounds I've heard in my life. Hearing the Chromaller sound effect when he enters a room caused such a deep disturbance in my mind and stomach that I would sometimes audibly gasp. Sound direction-wise, this game is a master piece, but I can't say that about the entire package. Fear and Hunger isn't perfect, though you can chalk some of these criticisms as nitpicks. Typos are rampant, and a lot of the times fights aren't really something that are beneficial to pursue, which is understandable from a lore and horror perspective, but considering how unique the limb system is and how you can have different spells for your character each run, it's unfortunate that the game doesn't push you to fight as often. The nature of the game puts you in this annoying limbo sometimes where you're save scumming since it's more viable than taking every punishment on the nose, which is unfortunate fortunate since that doesn't feel like the penalty that Happy Paintings was going for when he made this game. If your character loses an arm, I think from a design perspective he'd rather the player have continued regardless, instead of just loading a file over and over until you make it through unscathed, though that is a punishment in its own right. There is a difficulty mode that forbids you from saving at all which solves this, but I'd have liked to see some sort of middle grounds like Lisa's painful mode which lets you only save at each checkpoint one time. Everything I just mentioned is far from the most eyebrow raising thing about this game, as as it's had its share of controversy. Some people have critiqued Fear and Hunger's more vulgar parts by saying that it goes too far. There is no remorse for any character here regardless of background or age, and provided you lose a battle, some enemies can do very unsavory things. But in a landscape where so many people are straight up apologizing for their own art or editing their past creations, I have to disagree and commend Happy Paintings for what he was brave enough to include in this release. The wretched lengths that this game will go to, and the unholy things its enemies are willing to inflict on your character set its world and tonal feel in a different realm than most titles. There is no mercy. Provided the multiple characters, various starting items, difficulty modes, and branching pathways weren't enough to sate the hunger part of Fear and Hunger, you'll be relieved to know that there's a sequel as well, complete with its own different setting, far removed from the medieval horror you might have somehow gotten used to in the first title. I have mixed feelings on changing where the game takes place so drastically, especially since medieval horror isn't a setting that's explored nearly enough, but maybe that's just because I'm only judging the trailers and I haven't gotten to play it yet. You can go ahead and let me know if you'd like a video on that one in the comments, but I have to say, this game altered my perspective on something that I really didn't think it would. Fear and Hunger changed how I view RPG Maker. With the exception of Lisa and some Omori mods, I never really got engaged from a gameplay perspective with a lot of these titles. It's certainly not for everyone as there are no compromises in its art design or vulgarity, but if you've got the stomach for it and don't mind games that explore the darkest part of the human condition, it's hard to imagine you can go wrong in the dungeons of fear and hunger.